Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we will achieve that goal by showing you this video of a car stop where police not only potentially broke the law by searching and harassing a passenger, but also used their unlimited power in ways that reveal why the institution itself is a threat to the system it purports to serve. But before I get started, I want you to know that if you have video evidence of police misconduct, please email it to us privately at par at therealnews.com. And please like, share, and comment on our video. Videos. You know I read your comments and that I appreciate them. And we do have a Patreon link pinned below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do because we don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is greatly appreciated. Okay, we've gotten that out of the way. Now, if there is one topic that is central to the theme of this show, it is the idea of police power, meaning that one of the most consequential and often overlooked facets of governmental intrusion on our lives often begins with a badge and due in part to the mainstream media's obsession with policing and the political economy which surrounds it, we rarely if ever explore what it means to empower a growing group of individuals with the ability to stop, detain, and even imprison us at their discretion. And not just any type of police power, but the idea we have discussed often on the show that we call hegemonic policing. The concept, put simply, is that often police use their power not in the pursuit of public safety, but rather to project their authority in a way that is both symbolic and revealing. The purpose of this projection is twofold. One, to ensure that the absurd debate in America about policing, that you're either for it or against it, continues ad infinitum without a real discussion on how policing can and should be reformed, but secondly, that the unchecked authority police exercise without constraint often leads to unjust results, or put simply, might often makes right. But because we often try introducing concepts like hegemonic policing to real world situations, we will focus on one aspect of this idea today. And we will do so by showing you this protracted arrest, which occurred in Paducah, Kentucky, and how it embodies many of the problems with unchecked police power that often get overlooked. The reason we are showing this arrest as a lens through which to explore the dynamics of police power is due to how revealing this footage is about the topic itself. That's because the video you are seeing now gives us a rare insight into how police think when they are exercising this type of unchecked authority. The story begins in Paducah, Kentucky, where an officer from the Paducah Police Department decided to pull a truck over for the horrifying crime, wait for it, of a broken tag light. Now, just a note on why this part of the story is important. Police partisans are constantly reminding us that one of the most dangerous situations American police face is notably the car stop. Not, say, confronting mass shooters or staring down a murder, but rather the routine, run-of-the-mill encounters with motorists. So setting aside the fact for a moment that the debate over this assertion has some pretty glaring contradictions if taken at face value, it begs a simple question. If car stops are so dangerous, why stop someone for such a minor infraction? Why take the risk if so little is at stake in terms of a threat to public safety? That's because, as you can see in the dash cam footage, it doesn't look like any of the lights on the vehicle were in fact broken. In a complaint filed against the officer that we will be discussing with the driver, the officer, when confronted with this fact, changes his story to say that the vehicle crossed over the line. Another assertion which is questionable at best. Let's watch as the stop unfolds so you can decide for yourself. Hey, I'm Officer Barry with the Paducah Police Department. Man, the reason I'm stopping you, okay, is a couple things. First off, your tag light is busted out. You, the lights that go over your plate in the back there, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you got yeah. the two of them? None of them are working, so there's nothing shining on the really? plate. Yeah. Oh, okay. And the second thing is, man, you're swerving in the lane there. You crossed over the, uh, um, the um, dotted white line and then over the fog line there, the solid white on your right side. Are you okay? Yeah, I guess I just didn't realize I was doing 
I was talking you. his head off. You're just talking his head off? Okay. Yeah. You got your license. Hold on okay. to that paperwork, okay? Okay. And then you got an ID on you? Yes, sir. Okay. Is this your truck, Mr. Ham? No. This is Whose truck is this? Dennis Bell. There are no guns or knives in the car or anything, no. is there? No. Okay. Um, Mr. Ham, come on back here. I'm going to talk to you in front of my car and get that paperwork from you, okay? Come on back here with me. Because I'm going to run your stuff back here in my car, okay? Oh. okay. Just stay in the car. We'll get out of here in just a second, okay? Now, as you can see, after he stopped Philip Ham, the driver, police asked him to exit the vehicle and then forcefully searched Mr. Ham while denying his right to a lawyer. Let's watch. Anything, right? no. Like knives or anything? No. Okay. no it doesn't mean you need to search. Well, me, I can pat you down. What? You're reaching around. Oh, no, no, Hold on. Man, no, I ain't reaching around shit. Yeah, you're reaching what? in your pockets. As soon as you come out of the car, I'm going to frisk you, okay? Man. Man what? Call my lawyer, dude. I mean, this is crazy. What do you need to call a lawyer for? Uh, because of this is ridiculous. How's this ridiculous? This lighter, cigarettes, your wallet. Lighter, cigarettes, wallet. I'm allowed to frisk you, okay? Okay. So come on in front of me. That's all that was. Yeah, I mean, all right? I just, I, I'm sorry. I just... You're, just, you're digging in your pockets. You, you're pulling off your pants, which I get. But then when I say something about it, I feel you, you I keep feel having it. your hands in your pocket. Can I don't I know pull, if you got a gun. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know if you got a gun or not. I, I, I get okay? it. Okay. You know how many it. cops get shot? Too many. All the time. <laughs> okay. Many. And I, I ain't trying to be that cop. And then, unable to conjure charges, the stop devolves into a classic fishing expedition, where the officer simply uses his unchecked power to find evidence, press charges, or just make Mr. Ham really uncomfortable, which includes a field sobriety test, which he passed. Take a look. Y'all okay. um, come from night out? Y'all go to the touchdown tunes or anything? No, 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 no. He was walking down the road the other day, or not the other day, but earlier, and went picked him up over there by Western Baptist. It's just a buddy of mine. Over by Western Baptist? Yeah. He oh. was at another friend's house, and then he was walking downtown. So oh. so where y'all come from? Oh, we just went over to KC's, but they were closed. They were closed. Yeah, they closed down early. They had some issues uh, yeah, going that's on. Yeah, that's what they said. They had, little, uh, they had a little fight and yeah. everything. Somebody got come from maybe knocked out or got hurt, so they were like, cut it off. Gotcha, gotcha. How much do you have to drink tonight, bud? Mm, not much. I mean, not enough to really impair me or anything. Not enough to impair you? Okay, well, that's fine. So you don't think you're impaired at all? No, not at all. Okay. Your driving not concerning you, swerving a lane or anything? No, I mean, I guess I was a little distracted, you know. Yeah, you know, just a little distracted. Trying to put on music and shit. Ah, uh, okay, I got you. No big deal, no big deal. Let me run your stuff, okay? 374. Yeah. You ever been in trouble police for? Not in a long time. Not in a long time? What, what was it before? Uh, like, amended to uh, attempted tampering but I mean, it's been. It's what, what was. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'll look it up. I'm just asking. Oh, yeah. No, I'm What is it? Like, like tampering of what? No, what? attempted tampering with physical evidence. I, it wasn't even like. It was, it was like, like drugs a, or something? No, no. It was like a charge that they came up with. Like, uh, you know. What do you mean? Because I had an attorney, so, like, they worked something out. Well, I'm saying, what were the original charges? I mean, I guess, well, like, I was asleep in a parking lot or whatever. Uh -huh. And I guess they thought I was intoxicated. Oh. Uh -huh. But I mean, that's like eight, nine years ago. Eight, nine years ago. Okay. But other than that, I haven't even had, well, maybe a traffic speeding ticket in Tennessee. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So here, here's the deal, man. Let me ask you um, real quick to run some simple tests for me, okay? Because your driving's concerning me. You've been drinking. I can smell it off of you, okay? Okay. All right. Um, here's what I'm going to ask you to do real quick. Say your alphabet from D to Q without singing it. From D to Q yep. without singing it. Singing it. D, E, F. G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q. All right, count backwards, 74 to 56. 74 to 56, backwards. 74, 73, 72, 71, 70, 69, 68, 67, 66, 65, 64, 63, 62, 61, 60, 59, 58, 7. 
Okay. Not uh, satisfied after searching Mr. Ham multiple times and giving him a sobriety test, police decide that the lack of any evidence of wrongdoing does not justify allowing him to go. Instead, they summon a canine unit, ostensibly, to circumvent the fact that Mr. Ham did not consent to a search, and then they pull his car apart. Take a look. But this stop and search was not over yet. Not hardly. That's because after police failed to find a reason to arrest Mr. Ham, they decided to fixate on his passenger next. Face the car, okay? I'm gonna make sure you ain't got no weapons or anything on you, okay? You can put your hands on top of the car, that's fine. What all's in this pocket here? A bunch of uh, keys and stuff? Well, I don't reach for it. I don't know if you got a knife or something on you. No. Okay. Uh, I got my keys in there. Yeah. And then in my left pocket, I have a pair of brass knuckles out of Okay, so you do have some brass knuckles on you? Yes, can sir. I pull all this stuff out of here just so I can make sure we yeah. ain't got nothing? Yeah. Flashlight. So you're carrying around brass knuckles? I found them tonight. You found them tonight? Okay. Yeah. What's down here, bud? Uh, my medicine. Ooh, that's a lot of medicine. Keep your hands on the oh, car. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. What all is your medicine? Keep your hands on the car. Uh, I get the tribe, the boxes. Yeah. The tribe, uh, you got any meth on you? No, sorry. No? no I gave it up when I got arrested. Sorry. Finally, after almost an hour of investigating, probing, questioning, and otherwise trying to find a reason to arrest Mr. Ham, police actually put him in handcuffs. Why? Because they asserted the dog had indicated the presence of methamphetamine in the car, a claim that ended up being untrue. But despite the questionable hit, the use of the canine allowed the police to search the car. So, after handcuffing them both for questionable charges, the officer begins testing bills from Mr. Ham's wallet for methamphetamine on the hood of his car. I'm not kidding. They perform the test, which you are watching now, on the hood of an automobile. And from the trace of drugs on a dollar in his wallet, they carted both Mr. Ham and his passenger to jail, charging Mr. Ham with felony, that's right, felony possession for a few latent molecules on a piece of currency, a charge that carries one to three years in prison and up to a $10,000 fine. But this video doesn't just depict a bad arrest. Some of the video actually shows the contempt officers have for the people they are putting in cuffs, a rare glimpse in the psyche of how police really view the extraordinary act of putting someone in a cage that probably says more about the problematic and corrupting influence of police power than any other facet of the stop. Take a look. Um, denied consent, very nervous when I asked him questions about drugs in the vehicle, he looked away. When he got out of the car, I frisked him and immediately goes, oh, you can't do that, I want my lawyer present. Front passenger has manufacturing meth charges. Um, last name's Ham, H-A-M-M. -M. But this questionable car stop and the resulting arrest are just the beginning of Philip Ham's legal travails. And to find out what happened and what additional charges he is facing and how he is fighting back, we will be joined by him later. But first, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, who's been reaching out to the Paducah, Kentucky police to learn more about the case and how they are justifying this arrest. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Taya, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So, Stephen, you've reached out to the Paducah Police Department. What are they saying about this arrest and how are they justifying it? So I sent a statement and several questions regarding the complaints, along with questions about that complaint, which have not been answered at this point. They haven't gotten back to me, but I asked them specifically, does a car stop usually last an hour? Is that normal procedure? And how they're going to respond to the complaint by Mr. Ham? So I haven't heard back, but if I hear between now and the live stream, 
I will update people. So Stephen, we've found a profit motive in other cities like Loveland, Colorado, when it comes to DUI arrests and traffic enforcement citations. Have you found any evidence of that here? Well, yes, say you're exactly right. They're the same incentives um, that there are in Loveland, Colorado, we've covered quite extensively, that they participate in federal grant programs, which require them to make a certain amount of arrests, quotas, if you will, that you know this department has definitely participated in. They have given out awards. So it's a very similar system. It exists all over the country, and it's definitely worth questioning. So what did you find most troubling about the stop? And what does it reveal about, for example, our ongoing war on drugs? I think the most troubling aspect of this stop is it seemed like the officer had made up his mind before he pulled them over that he was going to arrest them. I've seen this in many types of traffic cases where they just continually go through the car, go through the person's pockets, uh, and generally take a traffic stop and turn it into a prolonged and protracted investigation impromptu without considering the rights of the people they pulled over. And finally, what does the actions of the officer reveal about the underlying imperative of police power. What aspects of this case are revealing and what does it reveal? Tay, what this really shows you is how abusive the war on drugs can be when it comes to police power. I mean, they really have the ability to keep you as long as they want. And as long as they find something, some object in your pocket, whether without intent or without knowing why it got there, they can arrest you. They can hold you for as long as they want. And, and really it shows that I think to a certain extent, the war on drugs was very pernicious when it comes to community policing, because there's really no limit or constraints on them. As long as they find something, it pretty much opens the door for anything else. So I really think this is a perfect example of why the war on drugs is flawed and why it continues to wreak havoc on communities today. And now to discuss the traffic stop, the search and the repercussions of this rest, I'm joined by Mr. Philip Hamm. Philip, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So Philip, why were you pulled over? It seems like this was a very minor traffic infraction. Why do you think police decided to stop you? Well, uh, Officer Barrow's testimony um, in court, he, he actually states that uh, he observed me uh, driving in an unnatural uh, driving position, um, not an illegal driving position, mind you, just uh, an unnatural one. And he determined that it would be you know, an uncomfortable one, or he thought maybe it indicated that I feared his presence at that time, you know, when I was driving past him. That's, and then he, then he noted the um, uh, tag light being out on the license plate or the license plate not being illuminated. And then uh, furthermore went to uh, suggest that I was driving carelessly as well, you know, but the video, the dash cam video, and uh, also different body cam videos show that the tag lights were on the entire time. Uh, you know, so that's some questionable right there. Were you concerned about your interaction with these police officers? I mean, when they pulled you over, you were very calm and cooperative and polite during the entire interaction. What was going through your mind? I would say, I mean, I think anybody has a little bit of a concern when they're being pulled over. I mean, it's just natural, um, you know, especially at that hour, you know, you, you automatically kind of look guilty of doing something illegal, even if you weren't. Um, but you know, no, no other real concern because I haven't really had any interactions with the police. You know, uh, the last time I had any like significant interaction with the police was about 12 years ago. Uh, you know, so uh, it had kind of like, you know, dissipated in my mind that, you know, police could be corrupt or police could do something maybe that might be against their policies and procedures. You know, you, you have this trust for the police, you know, to uphold the law and to enforce the law, but not break the law to catch me breaking the law. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow whenever you do discover that that's the case. Do you believe that your civil rights or your constitutional rights were violated? I mean, I have an opinion, of course, but what's yours? Absolutely, they were. I mean, it's it's almost unquestionable. Um, just the the demeanor of the officer, the, some of the requests by him, um, you know, exiting the vehicle, uh, you know, a lot of these things, you know, uh, this, um, this Terry Frisk where, where he suggests that he's you know, allowed to do it, like right off the bat, like he's just uh, entitled to that, you know, that that's not the case, though, you know, and, and the way he presents different laws, as well as some of the other officers involved that day, uh, you know, it, it's just an uneducated kind of misconception of what the law actually is, and, and what they need to abide by. So yeah, I mean, I would say my civil rights and constitutional rights were definitely violated that night. I noticed that your passenger was polite, honest, and cooperative with police officers. However, his Fourth Amendment rights were violated. He should have been free to leave and possibly should not have been ID'd or searched. What is the status of your passenger? What consequences did he have to face? I believe um, 
I believe my passenger, he was, uh, he pled guilty to a misdemeanor. Uh, I think it was, um, maybe if it was even like prescription, not in proper container, you know, they amended it, uh, you know, reduced it, maybe even dropped a, one or two of the charges for him. Uh, you know, he does have a criminal past. There's, you know, that's unquestionable. Um, but you know, he, he served out, he served out his time and, and should, that shouldn't be held against him. I don't think, uh, you know, and yes, I've had previous charges, but no convictions, uh, in the past other than, you know, a, attempted tamper with physical evidence like 12 years ago. So, um, that shouldn't even be an issue you wouldn't think, but, uh, that's, that's what he, he got and he moved back to Louisville, uh, Kentucky. And so, you know, he's, he's just out of town, but he's, you know, still my friend and everything, but now mine, um, I'm still in the courts with it. You know, I still, still waiting on a trial date, still, still trying to fight it. Cause I mean, I just don't, I don't think it was right. Philip, did you even realize you were under arrest? I mean, were you read your Miranda rights? No, I, I didn't realize. Well, I mean, I had an idea that I was under arrest because I was in handcuffs and I was restrained. Uh, I did ask the question if I was under arrest while I was a passenger inside the police cruiser. Um, and uh, no, I was not. I was not read the Miranda rights. Uh, you know, not until a much later time, if then, you know, but I don't even think at the jail I was. Is this the first time you've had an encounter like this with the Paducah Police Department, or have you had issues following this incident? Oh, there, there's been issues following this incident. It was just about two months after the initial uh, stop and arrest that you've seen the videos for. Uh, I was stopped again by the same officer. Um, it would be Officer Barrows. Um, after seeing him at a gas station, um, you know, we we uh i went inside he was standing outside with another officer next to their marked uh, patrol vehicles i pulled up to get some gas get some snacks from inside pack of cigarettes um i exit i go out there pump my gas they're still out there and i know he knows who i am i mean because you know of, of the situation that happened a few months prior and uh, you know i i had filed a complaint against him with the paducah pd you know about the incident so I, he he knew who i was and uh so he left went across the street sat there and waited until until I was going to leave and then he was going to follow me. I knew what was going on. I mean, nobody would just go across the street, sit there, wait in their in their cruiser, uh, you know. So I go over to the air pump. I air up my tires. I check all the lights and make sure that the lights are working on the vehicle correctly because I don't want to get pulled over for non-illuminated tag lights again um, because that appears to be his M.O. I sit there and I wait. I eat my snacks and... Uh, he finally leaves and then I, I leave so he can't pull out behind me. Uh, it's not that I was hiding anything. You know, the tags were up to date. The insurance is good. Uh, I just didn't want to deal with that again. And then I, I go pat, I, I pull out on the Park Avenue. He turns right on uh, maybe 23rd or 25th Street. And then uh, I keep going past. And then he does a U-turn right there, gets behind me, comes, pulls me over. And uh, yeah, and then pull, they, they pulled me out of the vehicle physically because I was like, I don't want to get out of the car, you know, just because of what happened last time. Um, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting situation, to say the least. So what are you charged with and what is the disposition of your case? The charges that I'm facing right now on the first case would be uh, careless driving and uh, possession of a controlled substance methamphetamine first offense. The second case, which would be the second time he pulled me over from the gas station, would be possession of methamphetamine, um, first offense, and non-illuminated tag lights. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, then the third case that involves the sheriff's department is um, trafficking in a controlled substance, uh, methamphetamine, not notifying the DOT of an address change and paraphernalia. Um, so, and all together, uh, it's about 12 to 15 years is what I'm looking at. Has it been difficult to get information or records about your case? And how has this impacted you either emotionally or financially? The whole, you know, the whole reasonable suspicion, probable cause kind of thing, uh, you know, they called the drug dog, you know, the, and the drug dog indicated on the vehicle. There wasn't ever anything found in the vehicle. You know, it was on my person what they found and and they searched that truck like three times in that video and uh at the very end you'll you'll hear the officer that the canine unit belonged to uh say that he found a roach and some scales in there but he threw them in the parking lot you know wasn't gonna he acted like it was no big deal like um and i'm like i'm, I'm just sitting there thinking to myself you know because i'm trying to you know 
be aware of everything that's happening, trying to make men mental notes of it and such, you know, so I can, you know, fight it, you know, myself. And uh, I'm just thinking to myself, you just threw out some illegal drugs that you found in a, in some paraphernalia, like a scale in a church parking lot where a child could just pick that up. And, you know, and like, no, you didn't, you know, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. And, um, you know, in the video, it shows uh, officer Hendricks uh, throw one of the test kits into the weeds, um, you know, after he tested it and he didn't get the result that he wanted, he throws it. And then they had to get another test and then he radioed into dispatch that he needed a second opportunity to conduct the test again. I mean, this is a, I mean, there's some shady, shady uh, stuff going on around here in, in West Kentucky, you know, with our law enforcement. It's a, it's kind of scary to think about it. Now, as we said at the beginning of the show, our focus today is on the use and abuse of police power. But it's not just a matter of parsing the law enforcement overreach we witnessed with Philip. That's because there are implications about this type of government intervention that go beyond an arrest or the errant application of the law. I was thinking about police power, oddly enough, when Stephen was telling me about a book by the famous author Kurt Vonnegut called Galapagos. As with most of his novels, Vonnegut uses a somewhat surreal narrative to explore one of the most fraught topics that often goes overlooked, meaning how we, as human beings, possess one of the most ephemeral and potent powers in the universe, namely, consciousness and what havoc it can wreak on the world around us. Now, I know you're probably rolling your eyes and saying, Taya, what on earth are you talking about? I mean, I appreciate the fact that you like books, but what does Kurt Vonnegut and consciousness have to do with police power? Well, give me a chance to explain. In the book, Vonnegut goes on to write that one of the most potent weapons of what he characterizes as our huge brains is pretty simple, but a very potent concept an idea. In this case, Vonnegut writes in the book that the idea of the value of money has evaporated because people simply decided it was worthless. So the idea that paper money no longer holds value leads to a breakdown of the world's financial system and eventually starvation and death for millions of people. But I think his point goes beyond our perception of value or our thoughts about money. I think what he shows in the novel is how something ephemeral an idea can be more powerful and potent than anything more tangible. In fact, I think the point that he's trying to make is profound, that a thought or perception wholly existent in our heads can actually shape the physical worlds in ways that seem, and I'm saying this ironically, unimaginable. Which brings me back to the topic of police power, because in the arrest you just witnessed is an idea that has far-reaching implications similar to what Vonnegut outlined in his book, that the root of the police power we just witnessed is the result of our idea that the proximity to a substance or a plant or a manufactured chemical is so morally depraved that it warrants a complete erasure of our rights. In other words, we have embraced the collective idea that simple possession or suspicion of possession of a pill or a plant is egregious enough to take our freedom and property and dignity at the discretion of a profession accountable to no one. Let's remember that this whole idea that the possession of a substance somehow justifies the harshest penalties a society can mete out all began with a tax. Better known as the Harrison Narcotics Tax, enacted in 1914, the idea was simply to order and regulate the flow of opium and cocaine not criminalize it, but over time, a bureaucracy emerged that slowly but surely imbued possession of a variety of substances with a simple idea. Somehow, proximity to them constituted and warranted severe punishment. Eventually, this tax and the 1937 marijuana tax were weaponized against the public. Now, it is interesting to note that much of this evolution was not a matter of legal scholarship or philosophical inquiry, but rather a narrative constructed by the media, or again, simply an idea. Just look at films like Reefer Madness or how journalists fused fear of immigrants and racialized mistrust with the use of mind-altering substances into a toxic cocktail that makes it so easy for politicians to up the ante. Meanwhile, by the 1970s, former President Richard Nixon declared the so-called war on drugs and the resulting mayhem and intrusion on our constitutional rights 
ushered us into the resulting mess we live with today. But again, all of this started with an idea that truthfully, I don't think anyone can remember where it originated at all. I mean, as recently as 2010, my state of Maryland spent $100 million arresting people for marijuana, according to a report by the ACLU of Maryland. Now, I can literally walk into a dispensary close to my home and buy it? How did that happen? Hmm, I guess ideas change. Well, part of the reason for this irrational approach to cannabis and other substances is to justify the idea of police power in the first place. Making substances that can be both pleasurable and addictive illegal is the perfect way to sow chaos in the life of working people and to rationalize the erosion of rights that gives them the power to fight back. I mean, let's face it, the war on drugs was prosecuted in working class and poor communities exclusively. Cops don't pull the type of dragnet search they executed on Mr. Ham on the rich or powerful. In fact, the biggest drug dealers of all time were pharmaceutical companies that flooded poor working class towns with hundreds of millions of opioid pills, enriching themselves to the tune of billions. An obvious exploitative crime that wasn't a crime at all, according to the law, because in the end, not a single drug dealing executive was imprisoned for conspiracy to distribute narcotics or the resulting deaths, meaning that when the rich and powerful possess drugs and sell them, it's called capitalism, not criminality. My point here is that the arrest we reported on today reveals what the type of police power we witnessed is really all about. It has nothing to do with public safety or curbing crime or any of the fallacious arguments made by law enforcement partisans or politicians. It's not about serving the public or protecting democracy or being the big blue wall between us and chaos. No, I think it's more about creating a story about us, a tale of failure about the working class focused on the idea to justify the extreme wealth inequality that defines our country. In other words, that being rich and not paying taxes is an entitlement, not extractive, because the people that work day in and day out just to squeak by are just not worthy of anything better. And that's not the only troubling axiom this idea of police power elicits. That's because I think this ability of police to confiscate our freedom or our property without due cause also has another side effect that perhaps is even more damning. I think to a certain extent, the psychology of this type of power teaches us that the government for the most works against us, not for us. I think it creates a sense that we have no right to hold the government accountable and that we serve it, not the other way around. Just take, for example, a lawsuit recently settled in Des Moines, Iowa, after a lengthy court battle. The city was sued after they detained and confiscated the camera of a local radio producer, Daniel Robbins, in 2018. Robbins had been filming a police employee getting into a car illegally parked outside the station. Officers accused him of being suspicious, took his camera, and detained him illegally, all for filming unobtrusively on a public sidewalk. Mr. Robbins sued, but a federal district court tossed the case, arguing the officers were entitled to qualified immunity because... Exercising your First Amendment rights had not been established in Iowa, but an appellate court disagreed, ruling that the police department did indeed violate Mr. Robbins' right to record and that the First Amendment was clearly known to the cops, a decision that led to the aforementioned settlement. But the reason I bring up the case is to make another point about the consequences of unchecked police power. That's because the point of arresting people for pushing back or driving innocently is to articulate another problematic idea about governance. I think it's a message sent to civilians about the dynamic between government power and the rights of the people that is worth pointing out. That put simply, it is a way to remind us that our ability to hold the government accountable is tenuous at best, and that exercising our rights is allowed only at the discretion of those in power, 
and not because these are our inalienable rights. I think it is an overarching and symbolic show of force that is meant to teach us that we are not in charge, and it is a means to allow the tenets of concentrated power to flourish or for the power of the people to be diminished even when the law says otherwise. My point again is that the hegemonic idea of police power is important to both grasp and comprehend. That's because government by consent requires robust legal dissent. That we, a democracy, cannot flourish in a world where arbitrary actors have unchecked power to diminish the rights of the people who put them in power. This imbalance literally works against the very idea that our constitutional republic is based upon. In some sense, it all begins and ends with a bad car stop which is why we have to keep watching and reporting on these types of arrests, no matter how insignificant they may seem on the surface in a country that incarcerates more people than any other nation on earth. It's because there is more at stake than just the freedom of two men. In that moment, captured on body camera, all of our freedoms were in question, which is why we will continue to report to ensure when that is the case, someone is watching to preserve what rightfully belongs to us, our freedoms. I want to thank Mr. Ham from coming forward and sharing his story with us. Thank you, Philip. And of course, I have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, research, and editing on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank friends of the show, Noli D and Lacey R for their support. Thank you both. And a very special thanks to our Patreons. We appreciate you, and I look forward to thanking each and every one of you personally in our next live stream. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us, and we might be able to investigate for you. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram, or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. I do read your comments and I appreciate them. And we have a Patreon link pinned in the comments below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is truly appreciated. My name is Taya Graham and I am your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.